their hearing is, is like 10 times what we can hear, so they can pick up the sound of a mouse at 200 meters away. Welcome to Nature Magic. Today I'm talking to John Carrick. John set up the Barn Owl Project in January 2019 to help with the conservation of barn owls in Ireland. John is a published wildlife photographer and has been involved in wildlife conservation and rescue for many years. The project team consists of a number of wildlife experts covering conservation, rescue and rehabilitation of barn owls in Ireland. It was fascinating talking to John and I hope everyone goes onto Facebook and follows the project. Apologies for missing our uploading schedule for the first time in 50 episodes because of that tricky little molecule in a protein coat, COVID. And also sorry for the big cough in the middle, which I couldn't take out as it overlapped with John speaking. Hi John, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. What led you to start the Barn Owl Project? Hi Mary, uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on. Um, yeah, I suppose, look, I'm a long time, like, like a lot of Irish people really, a um, long time, uh, I suppose, lover of wildlife and stuff. Um, you know, probably been involved with wildlife for, well, wildlife rescue for about 20 years, um, on and off, you know, I, I, I'd get people ringing me from, I'm originally from a um, small town in, in East Gower, Vanislaw, and people would ring me and come to me with, uh, when they find wildlife and stuff, and it just progressed on from there. I'd done a little bit um, of wildlife rescue in England, and um, you know, it, it, I wouldn't have been immersed in it, but anytime a call came in for help, I'd I'd be there, particularly for things that bite. I always <laughs> seem to get a phone call for stuff or tricky things where you'd have to jump over a wall or climb a tree or <laughs> you know that 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 kind of stuff. So okay. I was kind of like the, so yeah, angry, the, angry injured animals. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. Like you know, I've I suppose badgers, otters, yes. foxes, uh, yeah. stuff like that. You know, um, I'd get the phone call from people and uh, I kind of help out. And generally, all I would do is go. Um, you know, like uh, catch the animal or, or pick it up and deliver it to people, uh, you know, that would be involved in rehabbing and stuff. People that are more qualified than I am. Uh, very rare I'd hold on to, hold on it to, to, to anything uh, like that. So I suppose that's kind of how we got involved. And I suppose in, in the last 20 years, I, I would have backed off it a bit with, you know, your life gets in the way of a family and stuff. Um, and I kind of got back in, I'd still, I still would have been at the, 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 the kind of wildlife rescue, but uh, I always wanted to do a little bit more. So I think I was involved in, in I had done um, photography a course 20 odd years ago. A friend of mine kind of got, got me onto it. And then eventually I kind of got back into it maybe about four or five years ago and decided they were all going off taking pictures in the camera club of people and, you know, like taking pictures of landscapes and stuff. And I kind of like, I just don't have an interest in this. And I, what I decided was I wanted to take picture, pictures of rare and beautiful animals that people normally wouldn't get to see. So, and, and then eventually one day I took a picture of a Perricum falcon and um, I remember meeting and having a conversation with, with, with another guy, uh, Dr. Barry O'Donoghue, National Parks and Wildlife, who I've been good friends with. And um, it turned out there was a little bit of, we could say persecution going on with those Perricum Falcons. So I, I got involved heavily there with, um, I suppose, protecting sites. And it ended up that I ended up spending three years studying the Perricum Falcons. And uh, I had um, worked with Parks and Wildlife with the licensing unit. We had um, like live cameras on the on the nest sites. Um, is that up around the burn? The peregrine no. is one of my favourite animals as well. well yeah, no, that wouldn't have been up around the burn. Um, it, it would have been particularly in the west of Ireland, uh, Galway and uh, Mayo and places like that. So I was probably uh, at one stage, I mean, it, it was take consuming me. It just gets that way. It was like 35 hours a week, um, like every kind of given moment I had I wanted to go there and make sure it, it just you know you'd get a phone call from the landowner telling you there was some guy on the land and you were yeah. it just got there because I had discovered stuff that happened on the site and birds had been killed and it wasn't reported and it was just it, it got in my head where I just felt this and that happens to people it's it's you, you get this mm. sense of ownership um, and you get involved and uh, I ended up doing that for three years where Wow. I had the live cameras there. I was monitoring the sites. Um, I was working with, uh, you know, the, the footage being used in schools or, you know, like I had given on footage to the 
different groups to, to be used under license so that they could kind of educate people on what was going on in Ireland. And um, there's a lot of persecution going on. People don't, it's, it's not publicised. And, mm. and in that case, you hear, that was you one hear of about it up around Kalini, there's foot peregrine falcons there, and they've been trying to protect. Yeah. There's a nest you can practically see from the path. And yeah. they've yeah. had awful trouble up there. But yeah. thank it, you it for doing that nice. work for the peregrine falcons. Yeah, no, like I really, look, I, I like really enjoyed it. I had, uh, I was going under the pseudonym at the time of Ireland's wildlife photographer. Um, and, and like, you know, I, I wouldn't have, I suppose, I enjoy doing it. Every time I seen something new, it was, you know, so the amount of, like, I have, what, six, 7,000 uh, clips of, of footage uh, that I review after that. And do you, do you have a website? Um, not for that, for, for not for that particular stuff. I just, okay. what I w- what used to do was I'd post all my findings and stuff on Ireland's wildlife uh, photographer on Instagram to let kind of people see what was going on. I was trying okay. to instill a little bit of care and love and, you know, and, and yeah. it's like everything else, you put up a picture of a Perkin Falcon and, and someone is going to target you. And you, I off, like I found that as well. There's, there's always people that think that, that the Perkin Falcon is doing something wrong, the same as the buzzer's doing something wrong. And um, unfortunately, that's just these people... Mm you try to yeah it's, it's about fostering a love for the animal and also yeah. education that we need the the animal at the top of the food chain and we'll talk about the barn owl project in a minute which is yeah. really exciting but just um <laughs> it reminded me when you spoke about the angry rescued animals well they're obviously not they're <laughs> fearful <laughs> but yeah. um, a local vet called us a good few years ago and said um We've got this badger. She was run over and she's clearly got brain damage. We can't release her into the wild. She's really quiet. She's in this farmer's kitchen. She's drinking milk and everything. Um, Will you look into getting a license to put up some kind of an enclosure for her to look after her? And Mm. I thought, okay, well, you know, if she can't be released, we'll look into that. And I was trying to get the paperwork organized. And then I rang her back um, like a couple of weeks later. I said, you know, How's the badger getting on? And she's like, oh, well, she recovered her senses and got very angry and we let her go. Mm. <laughs> so she yeah. had got, she'd had a bang on the head. She recovered from concussion and she was fine. And she's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 one of those things. Like, look, the, I suppose it depends on really what, what we're talking with, like foxes and, and badgers and, and stuff like that. You know, it, it really depends on what's wrong with them, but they can recover very fast. Uh, I find with the like a lot of the rescues the rescues i enjoy the most definitely would be birds of prey like it's you know it's just it's something i've over the years got into but i suppose the problem with birds of prey is that, like it's one out of every 10 you get back um and like we have we you know it's it's an unfortunate situation so last week with with susan and battery rehabilitation ireland who looks after all and bev who looks after all of our um rehabilitation work i suppose like we would have one of our volunteers um amazing woman like drove from Dublin picked up a barn out in Tipperary drove to Tipper, Tipperary or drove to yeah it was Tip and she met uh, Susan in Tip Town and like I think she probably had about six or seven hours on the road to pick that barn out up and it, it had to be what sleep in the end so I mean it had a, a, a compound fracture multiple compound fractures of its wing um, and stuff so there's different very different opinions I suppose on what should happen if something comes in it could still yeah, have a level it's, it's of... A, it's a very difficult decision. It is a for difficult... A, it is. Yeah, yeah. But, so, um, so how did the Barn Owl Project um, start? And can you tell yeah, us so, a little bit about that? Yeah, so I suppose uh, I had been... Uh, with all my time out in, we call it the wilderness, I suppose, like uh, as a kid. And, and um, I mean, my dad was a great outdoors man and literally spent... It's not like today, we spent every given minute i remember coming home from places and he'd have to carry me i'd be so tired um so he's a great uh outdoors man and I, i'd never seen an owl never ever seen an owl you know and, um so i remember it must have been about six years seven years ago um my dad had, had told me that an, a neighbor of mine had said there was an owl on his property and um i remember going up there at night and hearing the young calling and i i the same as the peregrine falcon i every chance i got i was down there having a look and you know people might find it odd there's a 34 35 year old man sitting in the field two o'clock in the morning listening to these owls but it was something that fascinated me i'd never seen you know far like most people in ireland on the late late show um so then uh i kind of had come to my the conclusion i'd all i could do i suppose with the, with the, the perkin falcons i was in i was studying at the time and um i kind of sat back and i was wondering could i come up with a project that would make a difference and i didn't really care at the time what the project was going to be whether it be perkin falcons kestrels barnals but uh, i looked into everything and i, I kind of came to the 
realization, I suppose, that you can do very little for a Perkin Falcon. They tend to give you the middle feather when you try to help them. They, they, they have their own way of, of living. And um, the next thing to me would have been the barn owl that I hadn't seen any, like, outside of that one that I had visited. So I decided to kind of look into it and stuff. So again, I, I would have contacted people like Dr. Barry O'Donoghue, some of my National Parks and Wildlife friends and had I been asking questions and stuff, um, I would have got on to different bits and pieces around the place. And just after I'd done some research, found out like they were, they were in a bad situation in Ireland. And I, that, uh, th- there, was, there was a kind of underlying want for me to do something. So after researching, I realized they're very open to nest boxes and I started looking at the main issues that were, were affecting them. Like I suppose poison, well, I suppose starvation would be number one in Ireland. Um, you know, like uh, I suppose poison to be major, has a major impact on owls and all wildlife in Ireland. Um, Can you explain you know, like, to people about um, why, po- why it's so important not to put the poison down? Because I don't um, think people really understand the implications. Yeah, I suppose people have this, we, we all have it, like, you know, you see a mouse or a rat and you panic and you, you have to get rid of it. It's it's riddled in disease. And in the truth be told, it is no more disease than um, any other animal, like, you know, including the lovely barn owl. Like, they're, they're, if you were to crawl through an attic space to try and return a young barn owl, you'd understand. I've, I've done it, like, uh, so many times. You're filthy dirty coming out and they live in that. So I suppose that what people see, they see the mouse, they panic, they, they instantly go for the poisonous, the easy option, and they, they'll put it down. So that mouse, then, in, in, in Ireland, the poison we use is anticoagulant. Um, there's no real... Um, there's guidelines there, but for, for the ordinary householders uh, as well, there, there's nothing there to kind of let you know what's going to happen. So you put the poison down. On average, it takes four to five days for that mouse, after he's eaten it, to die. Um, in the meantime, that mouse could be anywhere. And so normally they would be out in the field, they go off to die. A barn owl or a kestrel, it's, it would be the two uh, birds, I suppose, affected the most by it. They'll pick it up and eat it and they'll get secondary poisoning. So secondary poisoning, depending on the level they get, um, quite often won't kill the bird, but it, it really affects their hunting ability. Um, you know, like brain function, all that kind of stuff is is affected by it. You know, like the the how your the blood can transport oxygen and all this stuff. So that's horrible. Uh, yeah. So like I suppose this year alone, we've been on six or seven sites where we can see the owls have have evidence of um, secondary poisoning. So I suppose to highlight. The study done in the UK, we work very closely with David Ramsden and all his crew over there who have probably the foremost experts in Europe um, on barrows, if not the world. Um, in the UK, their estimation on after tests and, and all this different stuff that uh, 85% of the barn owl population have rodenticide in them. So we know per head of capita that our Irish people use more poison, uh, rat poison, than what's used in the UK. So we're well up on the 90 low 90s on poison in our barn owls. I think That's for what, yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those things. But it, I would go further than that to say that um all predators in Ireland, and I found out lately from from being on a a, a talk that uh, your garden birds are showing signs of uh, secondary poison now and there's rodenticide being picked up. So basically if you put out your poison, slugs, insects, everything will have a go at it. Uh, and it's t- it's right. it hits the bottom of the food chain right up to the top, um, and that this would include um, you'll hear like we meet a lot of farmers and we'll mention poison and barn owls just don't go together and the, bar- the, the he will tell us straight away like that you know board B uh, have checks on them and they have to have poison down they have to have bait boxes um or they're in a in a scheme a European like maybe glass scheme something like that they have to have poison down but they're doing it and they're logging it and they're doing all these different it doesn't matter there is absolutely no safe way to use poison it's not mm. possible to use poison safely no matter what protocol you follow it's not possible um so w- what we find uh, obviously you're finding barn owls dead uh, but what we found like so last week when we went out to check a site uh, and we have cameras under license on some sites that we noticed that the male owl hadn't moved much decided to go in and check and he was comatose on the site uh, you know i could pick him up i could walk away with him he, he wasn't bothered and and that's typical of a sign of secondary poisoning. Um, you know, we called to the farmer farm around the area and asked him one of them had started with no poison in the last couple of weeks. And this was a sign of of what was happening there. Um, we find that over when we're checking our nest box at the end of the year, you'll find the barn owls, they should flush. You're not you never try to flush a bird, but like if they're in the box and you're going up to do a, some maintenance on the box and you touch that or off the box, it should be gone 
instantly. Um, and and in the, these cases, you open up the box, you you see that the, the owl is asleep or uh, whatever. So you, you know that there's, there's an issue there straight away. And I think there was a study done by uh, Birdwatch Ireland. I think it was 2018, and there was whatever birds I I don't have the figures off the top of my head were handed up that were found dead on the roads. So obviously it was a car or a truck or something like that, but I think it was up in 85, 90% of those birds tested positive when they test them for rodenticide. So that shows you where the figures are in Ireland. Yeah. Um, also, a lot of the time when you go into, um, you know, wildlife rehab experts, they'd often, even if you bring in a bird that's been hit by a car and you've seen it been hit by a car, a lot of the time they'll actually, te- they'll actually um, treat them for rodenticide bringing them in because they know it's in the system mm. you know um, um, we have to put um bait boxes around for you yeah. know, health and safety but we don't put the poison in um but they don't yeah. know that and then they look and say oh there's no poison oh yeah so it must be gone now yeah you know, uh, we, uh, yeah. so we <laughs> have a map, we, <laughs> we have bait boxes but we have yeah. nothing in the bait boxes we don't have a problem with them and um yeah. you know it's, it's about keeping holes um, records and closed uh, in, in in the buildings you know don't yeah, let them in yeah. and yeah, yeah. Um, how many barn owls do you think there are in Ireland? Um, definitely, like, the, we don't really, there's no accurate count, but like, you're really, you know, I, w- I would say that we're, we're definitely probably pushing 1,500 pairs at the minute right. easily. I mean, like, so for instance, if I was to tell you before we started the project, even though I'm based in Galway, um, we, we work the project throughout the whole country. So we concentrate, me, myself, I concentrate in the West of Ireland. So like the Connacht down into Clare, um, down into parts of Westmead, place like that. But we have, we support other projects. So we would have been involved in setting up other projects throughout the country. And we support them initially by giving them maybe like, you know, 10 or 15 boxes when they get started, then to help them out, figure out how to get funding and um, all the other bits and pieces to go involved in how to connect with national parks and wildlife and that stuff. But I suppose for me, if I give you stats in Galway, so before I started the project in Galway, um, I believe they were aware of eight, maybe 10 nest sites. So our project after putting in work and um, finding natural sites and putting up nest boxes. So we're up to about 62 sites currently. That's amazing. Um, and and yeah, really so, by putting up a, a nest box, it just makes it easier for the barn owl to survive. Is that the Yeah. So I suppose they're theory. natural. Yeah. Their natural sites would be um, like a crevice in an old tree or, you know, we, we very few of those in Ireland, but we still have, you know, the, 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 we don't know what the number is, I suppose, but I'm only aware of maybe like six that are in trees. So that's their natural site. We don't have big enough trees. And it, usually when a tree starts to rot or there's a hole in it, they cut it down. That's an issue. So that's natural site then, or a crevice in, you know, like in a rock face. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any of those. But so old castles, old houses, the house could be uh, with a roof or without a roof. They love old stone buildings. They'll be down the chimney. Anywhere you're going to get jackdaws, stuff nest, and they'll take the nest off them. Um, <laughs> old castles. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Old castles. Um, yeah, if you have a house, so I've often been driving down the road and you'd see an old house, one slate missing. Um, and I, you go banging on the door, you go nearest house, and you say, do you mind if I have a check? And you go up and you'll often find them in the attic. So old buildings and stuff like that, they don't nest in barns. Um, and stuff they, they hunt in barns so that, like, that's kind of where they got the name they'll go into a okay. barn at night sit up there yeah so they just yeah. sit up in the barn at night and um, they're hanging on waiting for uh, like mice rats anything that'll move in there and that's where people see them the most um, so if you put up a box in that barn then and the barn is extremely quiet um, they can't emphasize that enough like we've had a lot of problems with people would request us to put up a box we go look and we'll think you know, they'll say it's extremely quiet. There's nobody here. We don't use it. And and you come back and find that like the female has left the eggs or something. And you right. talk to the farmer and find out that he's been in there taking hay out and he accidentally hit the, the forks okay. off so the can, side of the you shed. You can spook them quite easily. Um, yeah, yeah. So they, it, it just needs to be. Now, having said that, like we have a couple of cool sites. I mean, we had a, a man um, contacts down Limerick went down to have a look brand. He had an old house. He put an extension on it and he'd stopped the extension because of COVID. And uh he sits out in his garden now at night watching the barn owls coming in and out of the new part he built and uh-huh. him, his wife and his kids having their barbecue because the, those owls just tolerate that. And then we have yeah. another uh, uh, beautiful castle in, in East Galway um, where we had a, a gentleman said, you know, he, he's probably in his late 60s or 70s. He, he knew my grandparents. So he kind of came in and he said to me, he's like, yeah, I have barn owls here for 30 years, but I haven't seen them in two years. So I just stuck a camera on the ground pointing up and they're actually living in the castle with him. 
you know, like they're, they're, he goes in the door that he walks into the castle. He lives in the castle. And when he walks in the door of the castle, there's a little hole above it. And there's the owl looking out of them. You can see him like when he's going <laughs> in there. But he just had been there so long, 30 years. You know, it's not the same owl, but yeah. obviously families copy families. And, and they're, they're just, uh, they're, they're not as afraid of, of, of you as people, uh, as, as some of the owls, you know. Um, right. Then you get, you know, you, you probably get the owls that are just willing tolerate nothing like they don't want they don't want to be around people they don't want to hear noise and stuff and they don't even want to be around livestock so yeah it's it's one of those things um you know but they will they're very open to using the boxes and i suppose the idea of of the box would be that um you know they don't have enough uh, nest sites and um, it's probably the third biggest problem so habitat and nest sites so we we kind of look for dead areas and try get out back into those areas by drawing them in so we we I suppose the, the first thing we do when we're working in an area is to try and discover are there owls in the area. Um, so we put a lot of work into it, like you, sometimes months that you're tracking down, you're checking all the old buildings, you're talking to people. Then you go talk to the community to get buy in from the community and see do people want to get involved at some level. Um, you're getting farmers involved so you can use the land. You're looking at um, what's going on in the area from a point of view farming and use of rodenticide and all this kind of stuff and then uh, after that you, we put a plan together whether it's putting up boxes or uh, the local community would set up their own group which is more beneficial um, to the area and then we advise and, and work with it with them after that and it's been very successful in, in, in an awful lot of areas but uh, there is a tendency for people I suppose <clears throat> if they think we found this at the very start. We, we, we don't charge for the boxes when we're putting them up. But I suppose the problem we have is that um, it's like anything else. You're getting something for nothing. You'll get plenty of people that will put their hand up and say they want it. Um, and I suppose that's not really what we're looking for. We want people to be involved um, and to, to, I suppose, help. Take, mm, take responsibility in, for yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take responsibility. It's very rewarding when you do it, but um, it's to get it. It's to get it done, and it's it, people think it's an awful lot of work. It's some work. It's not mm. an awful lot. Um, I suppose so. It's just a matter of driving on that way. Well, I would love if you'd come to the Bar Nature Sanctuary and see if we have suitable um places yeah. for yeah, because we have. <laughs> well, it's organic, and there's 50 yeah. acres. So there's 25 of kind of rewilded. Um, we have a lot of ash trees, and unfortunately, you know, the ash dieback is yeah. going to hit them hard now. But we're not going to take down any of the trees. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens there. But um, yeah, it'd be lovely to have a walk around. I know I have seen pellets, um, but I, I'm very afraid of all the local farmers with them. Um, I mean, they poison foxes, they poison everything. Yeah. So yeah. it's just have, really a um, lack of education. People think they're doing the right thing, protect the sheep. Yeah, protect, I suppose people, you know, you know the, the, like for us, I suppose, like I've never yet went onto a farm. So we have, uh, obviously this was first to highlight, we have reports of barn owls in your area. So we, we haven't tracked them down. You know, we need to get out there and track them down. Um, right. uh, would have had Peter Butler onto us, who isn't a million miles away from me. I think he's the next town over. Um, but I suppose, I suppose to highlight, like I've been on at this stage, thousands of farms all over the country. I mean, we've, we've, you know, done work down in Waterford, Wexford, Wicklow, we have everywhere. We've up in Dublin, um, Tipperary, Limerick, all the places, but all the farmers I've ever called to, like I, I don't ever recall one of them wants to figure out what I'm talking about, um, you know, like saying they're not interested. So I suppose for, for a farmer, the benefit is that I know there's not a big cost in poison, um, but you're letting nature do the work. So one barn owl potentially uh, could be anywhere from, you know, I'd say, thousand to twelve hundred uh, mice in a year it really depends on on the on the owl and stuff like that but so you're talking we had one site last year you'll see it on our facebook page um we put up the chicks there was four chicks on that site and the parents were back and forth every night on average between 30 and 40 times with prey items wow. so if you think about that for 10 weeks what you're getting you can calculate it out yourself but you really if you, the bigger the brood they have and and that brood size is more likely dependent on um like the, the quality of the land around them and, and how healthy the land is what small mammals and stuff are there um obviously in ireland we have the, the greater white it's true at the minute which is an invasive species and, and that's been good news for barn owls and it's probably um a, a major killer probably the biggest killer of barn owls starvation Um, they can't hunt in the rain they can't hunt in the wind wow. um so yeah, they're not that. waterproof yeah, yeah yeah so like they, they, they need these silent nights now they overhunt on nights then um i don't know they probably check their the weather app and say it's going to rain tomorrow yeah. and, but we find the it the store 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, they store they store a lot of uh, they store a lot of food and stuff. And um, so they store they, they store actual. They have kind of a fridge yeah. there. For... Yeah. What we find is so. For instance, I'll give you an example of of a project we done. So there was a, there was there was a. I won't give details on it now because the site is kind of. Um, kept secret but we we had a, a 600 acre site um kind of unique the woman that was there uh she, she's been working with us the whole time she's 93 uh yeah. it was an old estate manor who her her grand her grandparents and all this kind of stuff and they managed to hold on to the land because her dad was one of the, the good or grandfather or dad was one of the good guys he employed 10 people and he was very good to his tenants and um so they managed to maintain it so she was one of the first women ever to work um for the eu in brussels so she's fairly like very intelligent person but uh she moved back to ireland to take over the the, the house when her sister died so it's it kind of passed on it, it, through the family but she had uh danny who is is our soft release manager um had been talking to me about it and she never she had seen a barn owl once for the first time she got awfully excited that it was just passing through it was a time of the year where a lot of barn owls are migratory they're they're looking for their new territory, their juveniles, they're moving off and away from the parents, you know. So she didn't, and she was hoping it had stayed there, but we went around and checked and no sign. So she said it's in 93 years, the first time she ever seen a barn all around. So we went down and decided we'd do a project there. So we put up eight boxes. Um, we done soft release the next year then. So we had four barn owls that we'd have done soft release. They all came in injured and uh, we went through them all, had them veterinary checked, uh, got licensed. Uh, we camered out the site. We worked with people in the UK for best, best practice and we came up with a new kind of, design on how to get these birds back make sure they're hunting and doing all this stuff so that was grand got them out uh, that year we had we had chicks born on the site first time um and um but every box on the site since that day the owls have been using it so they uh, tend to use multiple roost sites multiple you know um so multiple sites more, so one owl could be going into a couple of boxes yeah, it definitely would be. So, like, they have this. Uh, people ask are always asking, like, oh, I mean, how do you know if I put up a box? Because owls, if an owl passes by a cavity, it has to inspect it. It's just ingrained <laughs> in them. It's the same with uh, barn owls are probably one of the easiest to kind of hack out. As in, what I mean by hack out is to get back to the wild. Um, so, if you've had a bird that comes in, it's injured, and it's a juvenile, and it has limited kind of hunting, you're not really phased by that. You're not just going to release it, but uh, the parents don't really teach them how to hunt. You know, the parents might bring back uh, like something alive to the nest um, and let it let, it'll be still bopping around the place. But that's about the limit, really. Uh, the parents don't. It's not like the Perican Balkan. I don't know if you've ever seen the way they train the young. They get the, the, the young to chase after them and um, to, to attack the prey and understand that they have to catch it. Where that doesn't happen with barnouts. It's just ingrained in them. So we have Aaron, who is our um, barnout ambassador. Um, something we were very hesitant to do but uh, after talking to people in the UK for school visits it's it's been a major impact so she lives with me and she's she's imprinted so she was never a wild bird she was never going to be released so if we, okay. we didn't take her I, I thought for she, a minute it might be your partner now I'm now realizing no it's an no owl. she's yeah. an owl yeah 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 <laughs> so like, you're I never gonna it, release her <laughs> no no <laughs> so she um, oh how lovely Erin yeah so she she would be basically she she'd come into the house in the evening and um i go home she has an aviary she's in she gets to fly around that but she's asleep for like 16 17 hours a day um at night she becomes alive maybe like just starts to get dark so i'll go out and get her bring her in and she'll interact with the dog and the cat she doesn't know different she doesn't know like she's a bird she thinks she's my other half Aww. so she often sit down on the couch behind me and she'll be pulling at my beer and i'll have to pretend i'm preening her and it's oh a bit one of these things she goodness. gets a bit cranky if i don't but but <laughs> if i roll a, <laughs> if I, we get back to the point here now <laughs> if i roll a like a like a you know a golf ball or something on the floor she'll go after it and attack it so right. it's just ingrained in them she still knows i would be fairly confident like if 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 she got out like she'd survive um, yeah. and i'm fairly sure that in her aviary when there's mice and shrews coming in because i found in her pellets stuff that i'm not feeding her so i'm fairly sure that when yeah. it, I mean, a poor unfortunate mouse passes through her every she's catching it and, and eating it as well yeah um, i heard that they actually see um infrared when um, they're hunting or how do they hunt no no, no. So they hunt they hunt their eyesight would be a lot better than ours but they don't use their their, their um uh, sight at all really for hunting anyway so they, they the kind of night that suits them would be pitch black dark night uh you know like with um, little wind, no rain, and it sounds something, they're up God. and they'll fly across. You'll see them whirling around the sky and land straight down top of it. They're here, and I'm not into the whole 
science side of it. We're a, hand, a, a hands-on kind of project, there, um, but the, the, they've one ear, their ear placement is one up high, one down low. And if you Google that, there's a name behind it. It allows them to pinpoint like to the millimeter where the sound is coming from. Um, Fascinating. But it, yeah, so it's total sound. It's it's there are several barn owls in in the UK and Ireland that are out in the wild with one eye. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they have, have no, the sort of dished feathers on the face which helps catch yeah. sound yeah so yeah. um yeah that kind of funnels the sound back into the, the ears the ears are if, if i show you barn, barn owl ear it's actually hole into the skull so if you pull back the feathers there's two holes one up high and one down low um, um and that's kind of and as for the facial disc then um it's just to to, to kind of push the sound in um yeah it's it's like at nelson it's the barn owl's the same then it's it's um the female in the barn owl is a slight bit bigger than the male. Same with all birds of prey. Um, and then you have um, the difference in the color. Uh, the, the female tends to have a lot of fleck on her chest. So little kind of dots on her chest, brownie dots and stuff. And the, the, the disc that goes around her face tends to be a little bit darker. And the male is is um, totally kind of, you know, he's white. Now, the odd male tries to fool you a little bit. He'll get some fleck there, but not a lot. Um, and I suppose that's kind of that. I suppose another yeah. thing I would highlight that people wouldn't realize and this goes for all birds of prey like um including the ones that are being barn owls generally wouldn't be persecuted the way some some birds are in ireland but um i would highlight that it's difficult enough for these animals without human intervention so if you take the barn owl site i've spoke to you about already um in, in in galway where we had the four chicks and we had the camera on it like before those died and they all got to fledge in the site and they all died and they all died within a week of each other. So what would have happened there is the, and, and this goes for all birds of prey, like, you know, even the Perkin falcons I was studying, what happens 85% of all birds of prey die for Christmas on the first year. And that's for multiple reasons. So like you could say like, is this, it's, that's natural selection. It's not, it's uh, like some of those get, if you think about it this way, like I suppose we're interfering with the food, we're interfering with their habitat. We've got trucks, we've got roads, we've got poison. There's, there's a lot of things that you could take out of the equation. So maybe it should be that 85% should be down to 50%. Mm. I mean, if, if everything survived, you'd have birds of prey flying around everywhere. But in that case, those, all those birds fledged on a night that it rained, it rained heavily and there was wind. We got phone calls over the next couple of weeks that they were found in fields and stuff. And, you know, they, they obviously, had, they all died in around the one night, but one of them came back to the site. We had watched it on the camera. And um, unfortunately, when I went to move the camera and, and clean up the site, um, it was one of those sites needed to be modified for, to protect the birds. Um, as soon as I went in, I found him dead beside the camera. And that oh. would have been starvation in his, in his part. So the uh, birds of prey in general don't need our help. Mm. It's 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 a very steep learning curve um, for so all birds hazards, of prey. So many hazards. Exactly. For them. Yeah, yeah. 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 So but I think what you're doing is just a wonderful job um, educating people, and it's it's such a catchy project, you know, the barn yeah. project, and of course all the other birds of prey can hopefully come under the wing of that as well. When people get interested in one animal, you know, they yeah, like to yeah. learn about everything and I, else. I, 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 yeah, and I would highlight that there is there are loads of um, people in Ireland now at the minute working with barn owls. there has been people down in like Tipperary and um, Cork that have been working with barn owls for years and years. They might be kind of looking after their own little area. We just tried to expand it out, I suppose, and, and get to the greater, the greater public, if you know what I mean. John, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been really inspiring. And can you tell everybody how they can find your project and where they can find you on Instagram and the web and everything like that? Yeah, yeah. So if you just put in the Dead Barn Owl Project, um, so I suppose the there's there's a few different projects you'll see you the, we have the the loud project going who's who's run by another rehabber and we have the Galway project and we have the Westmead project and, and a load of other projects throughout the country but the, I suppose the parent project is the Barn Owl project um, so if you need any help with which advice um, uh, anything if you're interested in setting up your own project brilliant we'll support you and help you we we really kind of want one in each county so we can kind yeah, of work we'd together love, we'd absolutely love to do that so hopefully you can yeah, come, yeah. come um, around and maybe you'll bring erin to oh definitely uh, yeah, we can yeah, tell people we'll that she's going to visit yeah, we we'll definitely have a visit um but you can find us we have a website set up as well it's been updated at the minute but it's still active um and you can go on there so that that's the barn owl project dot uh, or dot com you'll get there um and you've got like all sorts of information so if you want to make your own boxes we have a full page there that's dedicated to the barn owl trust in the uk so we have full permission to use all their information so they have like 40 50 years of um documentation evidence we tend to 
on our project, keep it hands on. We do study work as we go and we don't do studying and and hands on as we go. It's it's the other way around for us. So we collect the pellets and they go to colleges, universities. Um, so that's just part of our hands on work as we get there. So right. that's the way we kind of approach it. But yeah, it's on. We're on every platform, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. We just put in the Barn Owl project and you'll see the stuff there. And um, we're only too delighted for people to contact us and ask because there's no question that's uh, too silly. And my own personal mobile number is up there. I have no problem with people ringing me. OK, that's, that's very, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, is it, I, I just wanted to ask you, is there any particularly special moment that you can remember um, with the Barnals or even with the Peregrine Falcons that you'd like to tell um, me about? Well, I suppose the, I got the Peregrine Falcons. I have two, I suppose there is like the two, two, two species are very close to my heart. The Peregrine Falcons, I suppose, would have been you know just it was one day i remember sitting i followed this particular pair i followed several pairs so i had like nine over six i had her her leg number i remember getting on to um their local ranger to ask about, the, about this particular bird so i was following her and then i followed another pair and i nicknamed the other pair bonnie and clyde because they would be regularly coming back like more so than the other birds to feed the young like i mean you know it was it was four or five six times a day and there were very good at their job, should we say, but I can remember sitting there one day watching and um, very often I'd go onto the site where the with, where she was and she'd meet me at the gate screaming. They're very aggressive when, when they have young, you know, but I remember one day I had come in and I'd, I'd been sitting down and thought she didn't spot me and I, I, like I was in a big quarry and I could hear this noise coming and it sounded like a jet, like never heard it before. And I had been two years studying Perkin Falcons at this stage, but it just out of the blue, I looked up and it was Bonnie coming down in the stoop which is where she folds her wings in and free falls. Like you're talking about 300 kilometers an hour. And at the last second, she pulled out of it and it made a sound like something I'd never so scary. Like I thought, I actually thought like part of the quarry was going to cave, was caving in the noise it was making. So it was like, I, I remember going home that evening and I was, uh, you know, kind of, saying, oh my God. yeah, it was, it was one of those things. It was just, wow. like, so, so she unique, was threatening but, you. She was, yeah, she yeah, was I, she, yeah. She had spotted that I got in and like, I mean, I was still nowhere near the, the nest. Like I was, I was like over 500 meters away, but, yeah. um, some of the, as I said, like Perkin Falcons are all different. Uh, we had another pair that's like in someone's back garden. They're very close, you know. So I suppose that would have been it for the for the. Oh, amazing! Yeah, it's giving me shivers. I got pecked on the head by an Arctic tern once, and that didn't have that only had a couple of feet of a, and that was yeah, yeah, painful. It, yeah, you could have. <laughs> if she was, she could have probably <laughs> bored a hole straight through your head if you, she landed on that's, you. That's that's something you were going to remember. See, I suppose <laughs> last year we had like I think the coolest thing ever last year would have been that we we got a phone call last year from. Um, Inland Fisheries Ireland and like I'm always looking if you look at like our Facebook page I always try to give put a story behind and tell people exactly what's happening and I don't care to be honest whether it's good or bad like I mean you know we had chicks last year that were born on the site as I told you like first time in 100 years they were dead within a week because a pine martin got up and killed them that's nature um, and that was my fault I should have put in you know something there to stop them climbing the tree which we've done since but like i suppose that we had a phone call last year from national parks there yeah national parks while they rang me first and said will, you, will i talk to the fisheries um rang the fisheries so what's the story we're after finding a barn owl out in the middle of loch derg floating oh. um which is astounding because it should be dead at that stage yeah. so the, we made an agreement i basically jumped left work straight away said i'm going to meet you where can i meet you into port tumla picked picked up the owl it was left in a shop for me you know in a box <laughs> picked it up and i said like it was just dead i said oh this my god it's dead like you know and um so i was kind of saying to myself that's unfortunately that's another one for you know we collect that we would collect the bodies for the colleges that want them for and i said uh like i was ringing I remember ringing up susan saying like you know oh, my heart this heart breaks like it's a female and time of the year she probably is young and all this stuff and but I put it into the van in the box and, and it was like, it was more or less, it was, I knew it wasn't fully dead, but I said, there's no way it's recovering. But I turned on the heat and put it in the box and next thing I seen movement to the head and it kind of set up a little bit. And it was like, it's legs, it's beak, everything were totally white, which is totally out of uh, coloration is gone. So I said to Susan, I said like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to drive to Limerick here. Like I'm going to take a chance and just see if it has any hope here. You're the best person. Cause if, the truth be told, if I went to a vet, um, a lot of vets would say it's that's an exotic animal. That's what they call it, and and they they don't know what to do. Yeah, it just I know it sounds odd, but that's what mm. happens. Susan, Susan, for the listeners, she's the bat rehabilitation. Yeah, um, yeah, and she's been on the podcast. She's amazing. Yeah, 
yeah. So Susan is Susan is like a falconer. She has some birds of her own. Um, she trains people on birds of prey. Like um, she's involved in an awful lot of stuff like that. She's been involved in rehab for a long, long time. Extremely knowledgeable. And indeed, herself and Bev are given like workshops. Um, and I was privileged last year to be on one of them. Um, on uh, two vets on how to handle and how to intubate these birds and how to look after them. So like they're at the they're at the same level as as, mm. as as these people. They they would often ring up the vet and or the vet would ring them and ask them having this problem, what do I do? And and so they're instructing the vets and stuff on a mm. lot of this stuff. And we have some really good vets. I have to highlight on my project. Um, you've ARC vets and Oran vets in Goa. Um, like extremely good. Martin O'Malley is absolute gentleman. Oh, I've lovely. rang Martin yeah. at eleven o'clock at night when he's going to bed to come in for a barn owl that's been injured and. Um, he'll jump up like he's up straight away oh, and he knows so what he's doing. Yeah. So I suppose that yeah, we we managed. That, I managed so that so the owl got to you brought her to Susan. Got to, yeah, got to Susan. Susan rang me that evening and said she she had um, done her magic. Basically, uh, had looked it over. Everything was fine. The owl was starting to come around. By that evening, she could tell me that it had young. It had a brood patch. So we were concerned about getting it back. Um, and by the Within 48 hours, she had sent me a video, which you'll see up on her Facebook, of the owl doing all the normal threatening behavior, um, getting it back. And like Susan had given it, like, uh, I don't even know went to the magic potions, but she had mm -hmm. obviously given it fluids and bits and pieces and and um, it had seen a vet, all this stuff. But we had released it and the video of the release is up there. Um, we released that evening on a site um, near its home where we knew there was two... Um, it, it, there would have been two nest sites very close to each other. It's the only area, I think, in the country where barn owls are. It's the only place in England or Ireland that anyone has ever heard of barn owls um, nesting within 200 me meters of each other. And it was um, John Lusby in Ireland, or John Lusby in, in Birdwatch, Ireland, that would have uh, gave me this information. So we released the bird there, and that was grand, and it was really successful. It was like, for me, it was one of the best things ever because we, oh, you just don't get them. Yeah, you mm. just don't get them go back. Um, two weeks later, I got a phone call to tell me there was an owl, which we presumed to be one of her juveniles injured on the same site where we near where we released her in an old house. We still have that bird at the minute. Um, unfortunately, even though it absolutely looks perfect and everything about it, it's been to see it's with Susan, but it had seen like six different vets. Uh, we can only find a minor, minor thing that sh shouldn't stop it from going back to the wild, but it just can't. So um, we're, we're working with Parks and Wildlife uh, on that one. Um, well, that's it's, a wonder. That's an amazing success story. Just quickly, what is the brood yeah. patch? Brood patch is just where she's been sitting on eggs. Um, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So the, right, yeah. The, the, the male in, in Barnolds, um, I'm sure there's the odd male that, that does a bit of brood and I've never heard of it, but the female would sit on the eggs and the male would come back and forth feeding. And then at seven, six, seven weeks, the female would leave because the chicks are hatched. They're able to kind of regulate their own body heat. So the two of them would leave and they'd, they'd roost off somewhere else because if the, what seems to be the reason for that is, I suppose, if the, if the male and female are around the chicks, it's it's ingrained in them to beg for food. Um, so they'll stay away. They'll come back in the morning, back in the evening and feed them. Okay. Um, and that's what tends to happen there. So the brood patch would be on the female for a period of time because the feathers would be worn away there yeah. and um, probably takes, I don't know, it could be anything, six, eight weeks to grow back. Oh, so we'd known that she had, yeah. So like, yeah. I suppose that, that, that's the kind of thing. About, that was one of two barn owls in those circumstances out of maybe 20 that we picked last year that got back mm. um, well that's outside. an amazing success story so uh, yeah yeah it is it is and it? it's thank it's, you it's, so it's, much it's, for it's, all your work with the barn yeah. owls and uh, i better let you get back to your day not to worry <laughs> but, um, <laughs> thank you so much for being a voice for the owls and we'll put all yeah. the contact details in the show notes and hopefully we'd love to see you at the borough nature sanctuary yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll organise a visit. We'll, yeah. we'll go down. You know? Wonderful. So right. thank, you, thank you so much, John. Cheers, Mary. Listen, we'll talk yeah. soon. Thank you for listening to Nature Magic. Our news this week is that Borough Nature Sanctuary had a successful reopening after COVID. The gift shop is restocked, so pop up for a coffee and a slice of delicious cake from our local baker, Caroline, from the Cook's Treat. We are open for two weeks over the Easter holidays and then revert to weekend openings for a while. Flora, our new 15-week-old Juliana pig, is doing a meet and greet daily at around 1pm. It was lovely to see the happy faces again and thank you all for the support. John will be coming with his partner Erin the Owl to talk about the barn owl, so keep an eye out on our social media or website for updates.